Hi, everybody. It's Misty. We have presenters from Consensus Lab, CryptoNet, and Probe Lab. And we can get started with Mate. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Misty. Let's start with our demo of the reconfiguration of a state mission replication protocol. This is about reconfigurable state mission replication in MIR. So just a quick, re uh, quick recap. What is MIR? MIR is a framework for implementing distributed protocols uh, that uh, we are developing at Consensus Lab. It focuses on consensus protocols. It is modular and flexible, and it's available under the link here. You, it's clickable in the version of the slides that uh, I linked in the Google Doc. It's a part of the Consensus Lab Y3 project about scalable consensus that you can also check out. Okay, this is all repetition, so I'll go, I went through it fast. Now, uh, in this demo, I'll be showing reconfiguration. So what is reconfiguration of such a system? I don't know what exactly the backgrounds are of the people present, so I'll uh, have a quick intro of, of what that actually means. So in a distributed system, usually uh, under reconfiguration, we understand dynamically, that means at runtime, changing the set of nodes running a distributed protocol. So we have some nodes or called validators in, in Lotus, that are executing some agreement protocol. And then we want to add some nodes while the system is running without disruption, without disrupting the functioning of the system. And we also want to make it possible for some other nodes to leave uh, and seamlessly uh, transitioning to like new configurations. The background of how that works in particular with our system. So uh, state machine replication in our system is implemented like this. First, we have the mempool that basically stores unreliably incoming transactions. So all the transactions that are coming in from clients, they are uh, stored in the mempool, but uh, the mempool barely gives any guarantees about uh, whether these trans transactions survive a node restart or uh, basically basically that's it, or some, some storage failures. So, this this mempool is kind of a best effort uh, pool of transactions. So from here, transactions make it uh, in batches to the availability component, and the availability component in our system it uh, is basically a reliable trans uh, uh, transaction storage. So it also executes a protocol, and when it receives a batch of transactions, it um, makes sure that enough other nodes reliably store all these transactions such that such that it's sure such that it's certain that uh, that these transactions will be available for anybody who asks for them when this availability of the stored transactions is ensured it issues an an availability certificate so for each batch it receives it uh, issues an availability certificate when these transactions are available but uh, it is not guaranteed that all nodes issue the availability certificates in the same order. That's why these availability certificates go to the ordering component of our system. And uh, it establishes a total order of uh, the availability certificate. So this is basically the consensus protocol, the core of the consensus protocol. This uh, thing agrees on the order of the certificates. And then when, uh, at the output of the ordering component, we get an ordered sequence of availability certificates. Uh, they go to the execution uh, stage. And at the execution stage, these availability certificates are transformed back to actual batches of transactions that are fetched from the availability layer. So each uh, availability certificate corresponds to some transactions. We fetch those transactions. We know that they are available because it's certified by the certificate. Uh, we get the actual transactions, including the payloads, and uh, and we can execute them. More in detail, what happens is when this availability certificate comes in the to, to the execution stage, it uh, it comes ordered with respect to other events that happen, and uh, our system works uh, based on what we call epochs. It is not the Filecoin expected consensus epochs. This, this is a different notion of epoch. And uh, so basically what we get here is certificates 
interleaved with new epoch events. All this is totally ordered. Then, as I said, we we fetch the batches of transactions from the availability layer, and then uh, we have another ordered sequence of batches and new epoch events and here some of these transactions can be special configuration transactions and this is where which uh, this is what is uh, important for the reconfiguration that I'm, that I'm going to show so some of these transactions are special ones that that uh, change the configuration of the system they are filtered out here and uh, they are also ordered with respect to epochs and then the system contains some some configuration state, and when, whenever there is uh, a new epoch, all the configuration transactions are they take effect, and uh, all the components of the system uh, receive an event that uh, they need to reconfigure, and then that means that they need to create the connections to the newly coming nodes, maybe close the one to the old, call, close the connection to the old nodes and uh, do a bunch of other things that, that are required for, for the system to smoothly transition to, to the next configuration. And the transactions that are not configuration transactions, they're basically just application transactions. They are assembled into blocks and ships to actual execution. We dynamically change the set of nodes. This is, this is what we will show in the demo. And we will show it in a chat demo application that I was using also last time to, to show the fault tolerance of the system. And then Dennis will show how this is uh, integrated into Filecoin and how we can add Filecoin nodes running near consensus and still reconfigure. All right, so here I already have prepared four nodes that are running a demo chat application. If I just run it, they have a configuration. They have some initial configuration you can see here in the in the argument it's a static configuration of four nodes that each of them loads to know how to connect to the others for example i can then this is a simple chat demo application i can say hello from one node and the others receive the message if everybody says hello at the same time or they, let's say they say hi everybody gets the chat message in the same order i modified the application such that uh, such that I can have special messages. When you type a special chat message, it actually is interpreted as a configuration transaction. And uh, I need to just tell the system which node and, uh, at, and at which address will be joining. So I have, I have another node ready here. So here I run the chat demo. I give it a new configuration that already includes the four nodes and itself. I tell it to use the leap P2P network transport, and I tell it I tell it that its own ID is four. So basically, each node can be at initialization can be configured with a static membership file, saying that ID node with ID four, for example, which would be this node, is at this IP address at this port, and so on. So let me actually copy this because this will be useful. So. I'll just run the newly joining node with the new configuration. And uh, here I can send a special message now st that starts like config and node. And now I paste the ID of the newly joined node and its address. It interprets the message as a new joining node and it's adding the node. Now this node. It was complaining for some time that uh, it couldn't find the other nodes because they hadn't uh, talked to it yet. But now the newly joining node downloaded the state. The state con consists of all the messages that have been sent so far and can send messages like hi, hi, here, and all the other nodes they found. It. I mean, so it's integrated in the system now. So thank you very much. And uh, I'll give it back to Dennis to show how this works in uh, Unicode. Okay, so in this, in the second demo, we will use Udica client instead of uh, Mir's chat uh, application. And uh, the demo will be as follows. So we have uh, three Udica nodes with uh, proof of work in the rootnet. And then we will create a subnet with uh, Mir consensus uh, protocol containing initially two validators. 
and uh, they will be creating blocks. And after some after some time, we will add a third node to that subnet, and we will uh, see that this new node will be able to uh, create new blocks in this subnet. So uh, this is that was a scenario, and now uh, we start our script with three. Uh, Udica uh, clients and uh, with proof of work. Here we can see uh, miner and uh, uh, daemon for each node. And uh, now we can, so we have started proof of work, uh, consensus uh, on all nodes. And now we can see that uh, each client uh, is mining blocks and uh, gets rewards because if we have only three nodes. Uh, the fourth node is uh, can uh, we can see that it's not be able to mine the blocks. Now, when all uh, nodes have enough tokens to create and join a new subnet. We create a subnet with a mere consensus, and it requires at least two validators to start mining in this subnet. Now the node zero is joining this subnet, and in val address parameter we uh, we provide a full. Uh, node ID from mere perspective. So that's uh, lib P2P identity. Then we do the same for the second node. And uh, now to, we can see that uh, both validators are mining blocks in, in the subnet with mere consensus protocol. After that, uh, we add the third node. And to add this node into MIR, uh, the reconfiguration mechanism is, is used. And we do the same, start mining, and now you can see that the third node is mining blocks to prove that the last node uh, has connected to the network. We will send tokens from uh, the third client to the first client. We will send three tokens and we'll check that the first node will get it. So we provide the address of the first node and send three tokens. And now let's check that the, this, the first node has received it. So it should have three tokens. Yes. So that's it from, from my side. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Daniel. And we have up next Nicholas, and he'll be doing a short overview of the Medusa project. Hi, everybody. Today I'm going to talk to you about Medusa, a project I've been working on the last few months at CryptoNet. As we're going to talk about uh, fractional network and on-chain data management. Um, so let's drive right in. What is Medusa? Medusa, I'd like to describe it as a toolbox to do many things. Uh, to do programmatic access control, uh, which is the first application we're going to focus on on-chain, uh, time encryption, one has begun, and many other stuff. Basically, you can think of it as Medusa allows uh, smart contract or any application, but we're focusing on uh, the central application today to all the private key uh, via a threshold network. We have a demo about access control we can showcase later on um, on Gurley, a firm, and uh, let's dive right in what it, what it means all of this. So let's take a, take, take a step back and what is the problem exactly? Like right now, 
in terms of uh, private information, there is nothing private basically on, on chain. Uh, so everything you send is kind of public. Um, and so the smart contract acts as a third private, uh, third party, but it cannot hold anything private to its own. So it's a complete public, uh, state public uh, third party. And so that means the smart contract cannot sign or perform any kind of operation uh, on chain. It's uh, just uh, attesting and running some logic, but not logic which includes uh, private information. What do we want to do if we could have the possibility of having a smart contract which has a private key, then we could do many things. We could do, for example, one thing but which are the focus of this talk right now is uh, programmatic access control. So, for example, uh, you get access to this document if you show you have this NFT during this event, or uh, I will give uh, this access to this mailing list to all ads uh, protocol at AI user, or uh, anything, any condition you can actually prove um, in a smart contract or in overweights. Um, so general concept of on-chain bolts. And so how does this work in the context of Medusa? So Medusa is kind of a network by itself, okay? A network of nodes, uh, it's a threshold network. So that means uh, there's uh, some kind of uh, assumptions here about uh, the honesty of the network. So we need more than 50% can be any threshold to be honest, and in this case, the network will uh, hold the key without anybody knowing it. So no, no nodes of Medusa will know the key, and nobody will know the key, but yet the smart contract can use it. Um, it's very, and when you integrate this design into the uh, blockchain mindsets, then you kind of have this oracle-like design, kind of similar to chaining for those we know. So when the smart contract wants to, for example, that, let's say one operation you can do with a private key is decrypt something. So the smart contract can see a decryption request to the Medusa network, and then second, the Medusa network will decrypt it and push back the plain text. Okay, so you really have to think about the Medusa as an extension of the smart contract in this way. And so what you can do with it now is you can do things like programmatic access control in a very easy manner. Um, so basically, the imagine plenty of application that needs to have access control, like for example, document sharing or private mailing list or even the music platform, whatever. Um, they they delegate their, their let's say their key to Medusa in in some sense they don't do anything but when they use Medusa it's kind of similar to like, is they have the key but they get to Medusa and they ask the Medusa uh, network to operate on their behalf and so any smart contract in Medusa there's no registration you just say hey Medusa decrypt me this thing and that's about it it's like one call. Uh, there are kind of two modes about Medusa, like you can have a global decryption where the Medusa network completely decrypts the ciphertext and push it on chain. So you now you have the rebuild your message. Um, but this is this can be uh, useful for applications like, uh, I don't know, bets or auctions, things like this. But you can have also, and this is the focus of the demo that we have today, uh, about uh, focus on that re-encrypting ciphertext. So if this is what we need for access control management, like the document sharing, um, uh, we request that you, that the Medusa network decrypts this document explicitly for Bob. So it requests the decryption for Bob and the Medusa network is of decrypting it, we just re-encrypt the document towards Bob. So how does it work, let's say, from end to end as user, uh, the user flow? So let's say, imagine we have Alice, which has a new super top secret document. First thing it does is encrypting it, okay, right? So now it has a cipher text. Second thing it does, uh, Alice will submit the uh, document or the, the, the key of the encryption. It will submit the uh, encrypted key of that lead to the encryption of the documents and it will lead to an event on Medusa. So now the Medusa network is aware that there is this encryption uh, document somewhere, uh, but it doesn't do anything yet, right? And later on, it can be one week, one month, one year afterwards. Uh, then the bond comes in and say, hey, I want to read these documents. Uh, and so now it goes to the document sharing smart contract and, and say, hey, I want to read. And now the document sharing pl platform needs to say, okay, is Bob authorized or not? And this is a custom logic. It, any, anybody could come code his own custom logic. It could be if Bob is more than 18 years old or if he's take the uh, enough if or somewhere, like it can be anything. And then if the Bob has uh, the right to access the document, then the document sharing platform will ask the, the decryption, the re-encryption to, uh, to the Medusa network. And so now the Medusa network will read everything, will read the decryption request and the submission event from ICE, and it will re-encrypt. So it will never decrypt the ciphertext. At no point in time, the, the encryption will be revealed, uh, will be uh, revealed. And so then once that does meet internally, it will push the, the re-encryption on-chain, 
to the Medisa smart contract, which will push it to the document sharing. And then Bob will see, oh, okay, my re-encryption re is ready. He downloads it on the browser or on his command line interface, whatever, and then you do a local decryption. So then he can read the document by himself locally on his computer. And that's kind of the whole workflow we've been working on right now uh, on this Medusa project. Uh, right now, there's uh, only me for this last month, and we just hired somebody that will help me on the smart contract on the back end side, Jonathan Isselman. And then we have a working proof of concept codes. Uh, you can check out uh, the code, which is not completely public yet. So you need to ask me first if you want to have um, invites. It's based on Rust uh, for all the backend and the solidity right now because we deploy the proof of concept code on Gurley. Um, and the nodes communicate via lib P2P. We will run the server, uh, pretty basic stuff. We have a demo, which I'm going to show you later. On the future, we want to expand a little bit the use cases. So like I said at the beginning, there is um, a trust control, but we can do all see one as beacon, we can do time encryption where uh, uh, upon any condition or witness encryption, general witness encryption, or upon any condition, then we reveal something. Uh, we can also do add privacy on top of what are the condition for somebody to be able to ask the decryption. Uh, this could be private as well. So you could not reveal that your name is Bud and that you're more than 18 years old, but anybody could verify that at least you are more than 18 years old and you are somebody. Um, and MPC could, could help there. And as also we have a kind of a, we're trying to have some kind of research acts on the extending and the scalability of the basic uh, cryptographic primitive that Medusa use, which is threshold cryptography. And uh, as such as this, we have a first iteration. Uh, we made a first um, uh, proof of concept code of that uh, uh, DKG, so the underlying cryptographic community, which can run with hundreds of nodes, uh, which is not uh, familiar uh, now. And will lead to maybe a production thing later on, but we need to decide where we're going to go. And so this is a very uh, a uh, brewing project, and if you're interested to hear more and participate, or there's plenty of things to do, so don't hesitate to uh, contact me. And now I'm going to show you a quick demo. This is the ACL contract, the access control list contract, where there's only reader and writer roles. I write a, a text, a cipher, something, it encrypts about the chain, and there's there's a reader rule I can show you later that will try to decrypt, has to decrypt. And this is the Mediza contract. So let's say I want to type a small secret here. Uh, okay, so I play with my MetaMask. Oh, I confirm everything's good. This is on Google uh, Ethereum testnet. Uh, now I will switch to a uh, reader one. So I'm just switching keys. Um, up. And now I can read. I read. I can read all the ciphertexts. These are all the ciphertexts. Submission time. Submission like this. And now I will ask to decrypt uh, this one. For example, I just made one here. You see. Uh, we'll have to decrypt this one. So again, it's a transaction that was on chain. I asked to decrypt. So my keys is what listed already on the access control list uh, smart contract. So I can already read anything I want. This is a very basic uh, demo. But the idea is that anybody can code his own rules. Like there's no, it's just a Medusa is just a toolbox for uh, people to use on top of it. And now we submitted the, the transaction. Now we're waiting for the Oracle results. And in the meantime, because it takes a little bit of time because uh, we are on Gurley, I can show you that there are four participants in the network right now. There have been four nodes that are holding the private key and Mediza. These are all the address addresses. And there is a distribute public key to which I encrypt. And here, uh, sign message to I'm an Uber banana, and that's it. So I, you see, I can decrypt uh, from the border as well. And that's it for me. Thank you, everyone. Awesome. Thanks so much, Nicholas. And then the last demo that we have is from Giannis. Hi, everyone. So I'm going to start. Um, of course, this is work that has been done um, in, uh, in Probe Lab, which is focusing on protocol benchmarking and optimization. And I'm going to start with uh, a little recap of what I said in June on what is a provider record and um, where does it live. In order to do that, I'm going to go through the IPFS design on the content uh, life cycle. So what happens from uh, content publication to content uh, request and retrieval. So assume you have a document, you hash it, 
And what you put on the IPFS, uh, as you all know, is a provider record. Um, the provider record includes the uh, contact details of the publisher as well as the CAD of um, the person publishing the content. So what the DHD does then, it's uh, doing some magic and it's finding a proper node to um, to store the provider record. Then uh, on the other side, on the retrieval side, um, the requester would have to uh, know the CID of band. They, they're going to go and ask people uh, through bit swap, their immediately connected peers. And if those answers are negative, then they're going to go to the DHT and ask for the same CID, uh, which the, the DHT hopefully will again do its magic and hopefully um, uh, end up in the same node uh, and request for the provider record. So at that point, the uh, requester has got the provider record. So uh, they do have the contact details of the provider, uh, which means that they are going to uh, contact the provider, set up a connection and transfer the data. So um, what is the hypothesis of this work? So as we said, as we've seen, a provider record is a small file that includes uh, the contact details of the content publisher as well uh, as the CAD. And it is published in a number of different uh, nodes in the network. So in the previous example, simplistically, that was one node, but <clears throat> in reality, is 20. And the replication here is done because we want the, this provider record to be live in the network, to be stored somewhere. So in case some of the nodes go offline or they're overloaded or they cannot respond to the request, this means that um, there are going to be others that have the provider record, which are findable, they are online, and they can provide it to uh, whoever requests the content. If there is no provider record in the network, uh, if all of the nodes have gone offline, then uh, this means that the content is unreachable, which is pretty bad. So the hypothesis for this work is that because we've seen uh, high rates of churn in the IPFS network, which would reach up to 70% of peers have left the network within um, after only two hours uh, uh, after joining the network, this means that um, you know uh, a lot of peers, a lot of those 20 peers have got good chances of having left the network, which leaves a few replicas of the provider record to the uh, inside the network. So we wanted to see whether um, there are cases in the IPFS DHT where provider records basically uh, are not live anymore and therefore content is unreachable. So what we did is that um, uh, Mikhail uh, built uh, what is called the CID holder. Uh, you can find the, uh, this uh, URL down there on GitHub, which basically is a tool um, that produces content, produces CIDs, produces the provider records of those CIDs. It stores them on the APFS DHT and then monitors those specific nodes to see if they're still online, if they're providing the, um, the provider record, if they're serving the provider record or not. So um, th there are several features. I'm not going to go into the details there, but that's the main functionality. And we tested that over um, the live network and we wanted to answer some questions. So um, the one of the main questions is, uh, as I said before, does the record stay live until the republish time? So provider records are republished every 12 hours to make sure that um, they're alive in the network and despite network churn, uh, we are still going to find the next you know, 20 peers that are online at this point in time in order to uh, replicate the record? The answer to the question is yes. And we see uh, in this graph where we have on the um, uh, on the y-axis, we have uh, the number of nodes where PRs are available. And the, on the x-axis, we have the time since the CID, the, provide, the CID has been published or the record has been stored elsewhere. So um, it goes from zero to 38. So the provider record would be republished at this point at 12, um, uh, after 12 hours. But despite that, obviously the CID holder uh, does not republish records. That's the whole point. Uh, so uh, we see that the record stays live to uh, approximately 15 nodes for more than 35 hours, uh, which is a good thing, means that the current DHT um, keeps records uh, live. No content is unreachable. 
Now, the next question that comes uh, to mind is um, if records stay live due to hydras, um, and um, yeah, we, we excluded hydras from um, the requests that we've been uh, trying to, to make in order to get the provider record. And we found out that excluding hydras, uh, we still have uh, on average about 20, uh, sorry, about 12 nodes that keep the record alive for more than uh, 35 for more than 35 hours. Uh, again, great news because it means we are not uh, really uh, affected or not not affected, but we're not really dependent on hydros. So, what does this mean practically? It means that uh, perhaps we can reduce the value of k from 20, which is the current replication factor, to 15. And we've done experiments um, on this as well. So we reduced the replication factor, we published CID, CIDs, we published provider records, and we monitored again uh, for how long do uh, peers stay online uh, and keep the provider record live. Again, we see that, uh, of course, there is uh, a little drop uh, down from uh, 12 uh, sorry, down from uh, on average 15 to an average of 10, which again stay live for more than 35 hours, um, which is uh, again great news. It means we can uh, apply some optimization to the IPFS uh, DHT as it is today. What else does this mean practically? As I said, we uh, are the, the republish interval on the IPFS DHT is 12 hours. So um, perhaps we could consider increasing the republish interval. Uh, and we found out that we can at least double it because we've seen that everything stays live for at least 35 hours. So um, you know, even more than double that and double the uh, 12 hours uh, would still be okay in the extensive set of experiments that we've run. Um, so, um, but what do we need? There is something that we need to be careful of at, at this point. So when we publish a CAD, we're trying to find the 20, the K closest peers um, to the CAD um, in actual distance in the Kadimlia DHT. So we need to make sure, uh, you know, if, peers come and go, if those peers that we have chosen in the beginning of um, at publication time are still the closest peers after 12 or 24 or you know uh, whatever amount of time we're going to choose for the republishing interval. And um, again, we find out that 15 out of the 20 closest peers uh, chosen initially are still among the closest ones after more than 35 hours. So uh, we see this, that um, we see here that initially it's around 17, uh, it drops down to 16 and then stays stable at 15 nodes. Uh, so this means that 15 nodes actually keep the provider record live up until uh, 32 hours, at which point it goes down to 14. Um, now, the uh, question here is, does this include the hydras? It does include the hydras, but again, if we exclude the hydras, we're going to see a drop of uh, two to three nodes from that. So it would go from an average of 15 to an average of 12 and would stay like that for more than 30 hours. The conclusions of the study, um, uh, there is a final recommendation that will be coming soon. Um, we found out that definitely there is significant space for improvement uh, and this uh, builds on the case that um, uh, DHT servers and uh, DHT, uh, uh, sorry, content providers uh, are actually overloaded. Um, they they have to run um, high CPU machines. They have to uh, consume lots of bandwidth and so on. It has been a long-standing uh, issue in the IPFS um, network. So uh, this means that if we can reduce the overhead, then this will have. Uh, quite a significant impact. Now, roughly, uh, if we go from K20 uh, to K equal 15, we roughly have 25% reduction in overhead. And if we republish, uh, if we increase the republish interval from 12 to 24 hours, uh, obviously you understand that, that this uh, has got about 100% reduction in overhead. Um, of course, it has to be noted, but but that by overhead here doesn't mean the entire overhead of the um, of those machines. It's just everything that is provider record related. So uh, sending provider records, receiving provider records, storing provider records, and so on. Um, 
yeah, we're not aware what percentage of the overall uh, energy consumption of the uh, of the servers this is, but um, definitely this is going to be worthwhile reduction. Uh, we've been working on this uh, with the team. As I said, uh, we've got more grants on radius. We have the the final report, which is very extensive, several several pages with like many tens of more uh, figures and results than what I presented here. You can find it in the uh, uh, GitHub slash protocol slash uh, network dash measurements. Uh, it's pull request 16. Uh, it's soon to be merged, but if you're eager to find out more now, uh, head there. That's it. Thank you. Uh, you can get in touch. We live in uh, Probe Lab on IPFS Discord and also on Python Slack. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Well, thank you, everybody, for attending and mother of all demo days. Uh, thank you for all the presenters. Um, uh, Mate, Dennis, Nicholas, and Giannis. Uh, the next Mother of All Demo Days will be Thursday, October 6th. Thanks, everybody.